I'd like to entitle this piece, The Entertainer. So I was um, at this mission trip and one of the duties they told us from the very beginning was kitchen duty. Kitchen duty means that after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, they need three, four, five people to go into the kitchen and help. There's 40 people on the mission trip plus anyone who's in the place at the time gets to eat. The children that we served in the um, special uh, friends camp. So we're talking about buckets. So when you're finished, you put, uh, you put your utensils in a bucket, they're brought to the kitchen and it's like an assembly line. One person puts a soap on it, the next one puts water on it, the other one dries it, and another one takes it and puts it where it belongs. There's several rooms that you can go into. So, so they ask usually, is anyone available? You know, raise your hand, we need four people, and that's how teams work. <coughs> Every time they say we need people, just raise your hand. So finally, I, I, I raised my hand and said, you know, I'll, I'll do it one evening. And this is, this is what I ended up doing. Wash away my sins, clean me up, nice and pretty. The spirit won't rise, the spirit won't rise. You dump yourself off and the spirit won't rise. Check this out. My ain't talking about the look, cause we judge like a book. No, I'm torn from inside, it's the heart where we look. Yeah, yeah, that's the name of the John. You can get all the model, but what do you mean? You can get these things out of time, you can see around me. I'm a sinner, I'm a bird. She wants to come to this church. Uh, and uh, the guy on the left, he stopped me after, I did this in chapel, and he stopped me right afterwards, and he said, what is that thing that you're holding? I said, it's a speaker for the phone. And he said, it's nice, he likes it. And I said, I have an extra one in my room, which is really Paul's. While Paul was away doing cementing, I gave him Paul's speaker. <laughs> 
So it's a word got around. Um, don't use Marisol in the kitchen because she likes to entertain. And then uh, people started to get sick um, every day. Since the first day we came in, there was two missing or three missing. And the interesting thing is that the leaders got sick. And we have about three interpreters in the leaders, and they got sick also. So they left me to be an interpreter everywhere. And it wasn't something that I was expecting to do a lot. I was just expecting to do here and there. But they have two people that live there, but they got sick. One guy who came, Frank, he also got sick. So uh, when we went to church uh, that Sunday, I had to get up and interpret an entire service, which was kind of scary, but it was done. We also visited a man who has a pottery place, his own, and uh, he was doing a pottery demonstration. So I had to translate for there. Translated almost every morning or evening at chapel and did a lot of one-to-one -one translation. I still hear when I lay my head in the pillow, they called me Mari through the whole trip, which is my short name. And we had tags and I still hear Mari, 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 because that's every, everywhere I turn, someone was calling me to interpret. And then came Gala Night. Gala Night is they have a three-day uh, special uh, special friends camp with people in wheelchairs and who have physical conditions, and they come. And on the last night, they they bathe them, dress them up, do their hair. Um, the guys get all manscaping and all kinds of stuff, and then they they decorate this room that's way bigger than this, balloons and everything, and it's a night for them. So, um, and that night, it happens to be the night that the Americans cook. So one of our guys is a cook, he loves to cook, and so he was scheduled to cook and he got sick. So, and he was also one of our interpreters. So other people stepped up and said, we'll cook. So, um, guess who they needed to interpret in the kitchen? So I had to go in the kitchen and once the, the chef is a woman, Leo is her name, and so we had two guys who were going to help cook, and we had already bought all the American ingredients, you know, mashed potatoes and um, chicken and all kinds of stuff, chicken and all kinds of stuff. But I was there to translate on, you know, what utensil they need or food or how much or whatever. So the uh, Leo says to me, oh, um, you're a pastor, right? There were four pastors who came in out of 40 people. And I said, yeah. And she takes a chair and pulls it out and goes, you sit, you interpret. So now I'm making fun of the guys who work, say, see, I'm trying to work, but they don't want me to. <laughs> so, um, so I was sitting and interpreting, and, and sitting and interpreting led to jokes, and laughter, and then singing, and then dancing. And I think this video was the one where we danced the second time in that little place. By the way, this, the whole other side is filled with all the cooks. So, um, so, um, Entertainment to me equals equals love. It's what I had to give, and it's all I had um, being there. And I listened to the the Hebrews passage. Now that's uh, Hebrews thirteen. Hebrews eleven talks about um, faith, faith equaling power that we have in our faith. And Hebrews twelve talks about hope, and it's about our Christian progress. And Hebrews 13, where we are today, is about love. And it's about practicing love. So <clears throat> we're all one body, which is what we kept saying in the mission. We're all at a level playing field. The, there's one person with disabilities from the neck down, cannot move. And he's, he had mentioned a few years ago, they told us, he had said that he likes coming there because for three days, everyone is equal. Everyone gets treated the same. And so it's like this love is the Elmer's glue that holds us all together, and that's love. So we are, um, we're not to love, we're not to love like brothers, you know, we're, we're, we're not to love like brothers, we're to love because we are brothers and sisters. And that's part of the message that I got there. I'm not there to show love, I'm there to love because we're all family. And my love was expressed in entertainment, many other ways too. But, um, but after entertaining in the kitchen, what I've learned from that, that some people in the mission might have seen it as, you know, you're goofing off and you're not working while we're working. Well, out of that, and the language helped too, um, transpired many things. I, I heard the story of a, 
of a young man. I can't even read my own words. Hold on. Th that young man that stopped me and said he enjoyed the word and what was the gadget that I was listening to, I didn't know that his wife worked in the kitchen. And she came to me and said, I heard that you did something beautiful over there, but we, we couldn't see it. We can't go to chapel because we're busy preparing your breakfast so it's, uh, or your dinner or whatever. And it's like, I realized that this is the only word they're going to get. And it's a word passed down through the husband. And that's when I said, well, you want to hear it? I have my speaker right here. So, um, so that's why I have done it several times. And so, you know, they enjoyed the message because we talked about bringing the message to youth and to people, no matter what it looks like. So, um, so then the, the kitchen staff, uh, people that hang out, you know kitchen people, Sandy, you know, you'd rather hang out in the kitchen than hang out somewhere else. But they started to come out and they started to seek me. And there was, you know, if it wasn't for that entertainment, I would not have heard the story of the woman whose mother punished her by hanging her around the neck in the tree, on the tree. Um, or the woman who said that as a very young child, she was up at 3 a.m. in the morning, the whole family had to go to the farm, milk the cows, do all the work, and then go to school. And when she got to school, she would fall asleep and the teacher would hit her for falling asleep. I would not have heard that story. I would not have heard the stories of divorce, alcoholism, infidelity, single parenting. I would not have heard about the woman who lost her entire family to cancer, how alone she is, and doing pastoral care, that one-to-one, -one, speaking with her and finding that she had a talent that she didn't know that she had, and I'm still trying, and my commitment is to help her with her talent in art to express herself. Um, and again, that morning, the woman said to her husband that she missed out on chapel because she was making our breakfast and I was bringing the message to the kitchen and I didn't even realize that. So the, the scripture says that we entertain strangers and by entertaining strangers that we might be entertaining angels. And for me, I saw as these angels came back out because when Corey got sick, they knew he was my son, they knew Paul was my husband. Corey started getting sick first and they said, you know, we'll, we'll make him soup, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever and then Paul got sick and I got sick and they came to my room. I was laying down in pain. I had um, chills and joint pain and they came out and said, we will bring you some food. And I was like, you know, I'm not even hungry. But they came back several times to check up on me. And every time I walked into the kitchen, are you okay? Is your husband okay? Is your son okay? They did that with everyone there too. It wasn't just me, but it's just that connection that we have. Um, after, after doing that rap stuff is that they, they just were different with me and, and more forthcoming and more open. So they were very eager to help. Even the last day, they told us we were to have, be up at six, have our bags packed on the bus at six, go eat breakfast, come back at 6.30 to leave. And Corey came down, brought his bag, and said, I'm going back up because one of the guys started throwing up just before going to the airport. So Corey went to pack his clothes and his bags, and I told the kitchen staff, and they gave me bread and said, here, give this to your son on the way, because they knew he was still not doing so well either. So I was entertaining angels, and I didn't realize it. And angels are messengers, and we're all messengers of God. So we're all in the family of God. We all love, are loving one another. Like Abraham was entertain, entertained angels. Jacob entertained angels when he wrestled with them. Joshua entertained angels, so we, we extend our love to strangers by showing hospitality to them. So I learned that, that there are people around us to whom we could be very helpful, even if others see it as crazy or as lazy or as you're not doing your work. But when we extend our love to others together, we might meet some very, very wonderful people. That's my message today. In case any of you were wondering, wondering what this is, um, you know, Berto and Lisa, who run the Masao mission, part of their mission is to help the local community find ways to earn a living. Um, 
they do, they set up potteries, um, they give people the ability to build cisterns for farming, and one of the things is they set up and support a family who weave these things and they bring them to the mission, so they have a the market. So everybody bought something from them, it's a little bit hospital to take off right now. But these are all handmade by the Mazawa family, a woman and her mother. When I first met Pastor Marisol, I told her that I did not have a hole in my heart, that I didn't need God. I had him. I was okay. So if we're going to go on and have a relationship, I don't want to be saved. You know, you don't have to do anything for me. I'm okay. And of course, I had a gigantic hole in my heart that I didn't want to admit to or even think of. I was talking with a pastor on the trip, Pastor Chuck from Ohio, and he said, uh, that's a God-sized hole that you have. And he was right. And so, in the past three, almost three years, I want to fill that hole. And we talked when we were yelling our relationship about missions. And I didn't know what missions were, except that other people didn't. My sister, my cousins, my other people family, people did that sort of stuff, and to the extent that the others were able to, we paid, you know, we helped, we contributed. And so, we began to learn, I began to learn, what missions were. Missions were not going out and saving the world. It was just going out and doing something. Uh, it might have meant going to Oklahoma to repair a roof on a church that had a storm. So we started looking for a mission. And what caught my eye about this mission was, First of all, it was a denominational mission. It's, it's sponsored by the, the National Association of Congregational Churches. Well, in addition to that, it sounded like something I could do. It sounded like a hospital. They said they were looking for doctors, nurses, PTs, OTs, anybody else they would take. And I said, well, you know, that sounds like something I could do. You know? And it turned out we had to wait a couple of years to work it out, so when we finally got and we realized that it's not really a hospital by any stretch. Um, it's this mission, and they serve the Mazawa people, which is the indigenous uh, tr you know, people in that area of Mexico. Okay, fine, no problem. You know, that's great. And I thought that what I would be doing was labor, building cisterns, because the people need water. They're up above a certain essentially a water level, there's a reservoir, and if they, anybody that lives above that level doesn't get enough water per year to farm. So building a cistern is a wonderful thing to do for them. So that's great, I can do that. And then there'll be three days of, of uh, the Special Friends Camp, which is basically people in wheelchairs. And I shot my mouth off early, said, I know all about the wheelchairs. I can do that. And I don't know much about wheelchairs. And so the first day, bright and early, we get up, have our service, it's great, and they go around and everybody introduces themselves. And it comes to me and I just feel like, you know, the wolf in the hen house maybe. Like, I don't belong here. All these people are good. You know, all these people have been coming here for years and they know what they're doing and they can quote the scriptures and they can do all this other stuff, but I'm just a guy. You know, I can, you know, basically I can work. And I got up and I said, um, you know, introduce myself. And I said, um, you know, it's my first mission. And the, the one thing that I know is that everyone here is on a mission to me. That I'm, it's not so much I'm on a mission to anyone, you all are on a mission to me. So I'm the one that needs the help. And that sounds real good. And I sat down and said, that was really great. So, comes to the assignments. And I'm all ready. I got my work shoes on, short pants. I'm ready to go. And they said, and Paul's going to be on the visitation team. <laughs> go around to people's houses. And I thought, that's not what I came for. You know, what am I going to do? I know that Marisol speaks Spanish. You know, we can go around. And I'm visioning going into people's houses, and you know, I how do you do? So Marisol says, well, you know, you can talk to Frank. And tell him, he gets switched off, 
and I prayed on it through the sir, you know, through the meeting, and I said, you know what, you know, this is done for a reason. You know, so let, let's just go ahead like that. So immediately after the meeting breaks up, we're going. We're going to be transported to where we're going. Find that the Marisol is not going either. <laughs> they need her for interpreting in another place. I said, okay, fine. No problem. I'm still busy going to somebody's house, and I won't go on about what the visit was because it was horrible. It was the worst possible thing that I can or, or hopefully ever will have to imagine. So I'm glad that I did it that way. But the first thing I did in Rizawa was that I didn't help anything, I didn't do anything, I didn't say anything. But I got to see what Roberto and Lisa are up against, what, what they're dealing with. And the next couple of days we built some of things and had fun. Um, on Sunday, we went to a church way up in the mountains. I think our, our elevation was 8,600 feet, and I think this had to be at least another 2,000 feet high. Way up in the mountains. And this place was so incredibly beautiful. When you walked into this hacienda, you walked around, it was beautiful. When you went outside and you looked, it reminded me of what the Swiss Alps must look like. Just mountains in every direction, and houses here and there, and cultivated fields. From far away, it was just the loveliest thing you could think of. And when you got up close, it wasn't so. You know, the, the hard life was there. But just as a snapshot, it was beautiful. And as we drove to church, the road switched back. Went up, was going way up the mountain, and we're going along this valley. And I'm just thinking, God, this is so beautiful. And yet, there's so much wrong. And I said to myself, I can't help these people. I can't, I can't do anything. This is not my place. I can't come in and tell me you're doing this wrong or, 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 or what you have to do. And a voice in my head that, that I used to just call a voice in my head, and now I honestly believe it's just I'm listening to the Holy Spirit speak to me, said, that's not the point. They're going to help you. They're going to help me because I'm the one who needs help. They are fine. You know, they, they, they're okay, but I'm the one that needs the mission. So all of them are on a mission to me, which I thought was really great. And all the rest, we spent three days with special friends, it was all great. And, but it was that feeling, because from that moment, driving, just looking out, you know, the, from the bus, and, and you're just looking at this place, that is so beautiful and so neat. So they need so much, and there's so little that anybody can do. But if I go there thinking that I can help anybody but me, I can't. But now I know that I can't never stop. I can never stop doing this because the hole in my heart will never close. All I can do for the rest of my life is try and close it. And I can tell you how wonderful it was. How wonderful it was to be in a community of congregationalists. And um, meeting people from, from, from so many different places. And having people that on the first couple of days I thought, I can't tell these people what I do for a living. I won't we'll measure up to them. You know, there's pastors and doctors and you know, people that have, that have done things, and I haven't done anything, and have them treat me like I, you know, I, I am important, and that, that, that everything is important, and that, you know, the, the dignity of the people that live here, they, you know, they're not asking for help. They'll take your help, but they're going to live and, and do the things anyway. You know, Roberto and Lisa, they're going to be there. They're going to be doing these things. You know? And I found out what a mission was. And a mission isn't building a cistern. And a mission is not 
you know, spending a day with somebody that can't move his arms and legs, or, or fitting a, a, a splint onto a young man's leg so he can maybe walk, or at least believe that he can walk someday. It's not any of those things. It's recognizing Matthew 25. We first heard that a couple of years ago in, a, in an immigration form, and I have it on my computer list of favorites, and every once in a while when I'm too old down, I'll see it there, so I just click it on, and it's the truth that what do I want to do at the end? Where do I want to be? Do I want to be in one group saying, I wrote a check, you know, I, I'm okay, or do I want to be the, the one who did something for myself because the world is too full of things, the world is just too full of hunger and hardship want and need and I can't do anything about that but I can do something about me and if I do something about me then I'll do something about the rest and everybody said that I would never be the same after this and they're right and I just I want you know part of me wants to get up here and say you need to go you need to go to this place you know, you need to hurry up and get there before it's gone. Like it was Disney World. But it's not Disney World. It's going to be there. I just... The hole in my heart is a little bit smaller this week. Thank you. So, uh, in addition to that uh, one scripture, I also wanted to open up with a quote. And uh, this is a quote coming from one of the Special Friends campers uh, who was down at the camp that we were working with. His name's Lalo, uh, who you'll see pictures of later. And he said, I wish the whole world was like this camp, where everybody's the same. That pretty much sums up all of uh, what that verse uh, just said. Pretty much just one sentence right there. Uh, everybody's the same. Now, going down and being on the service opportunity, being in a position where you're there to help others, it's easy to put yourself into kind of a supervisory position, a position where you're there to help others. But any notion of that was kind of quickly dissolved uh, when I got down there. I really did see, in a sense, that everybody was the same uh, while I was working down at um, Um I have two experiences that I wanted to share with you that really stood out in my mind that kind of uh, resembled this. Um, one of them I partook in, uh, the other experience was something I kind of observed. Um, so the first experience, um, during, uh, I think it was around the fourth or fifth day there, I did an overnight stay um, where we essentially went and took all the special needs uh, in camp campers and watched them while they were sleeping and helped them go to bed, and use the bathroom, rest of eat, and get ready for the next day. So we'd be staying down in the same box as them. Now, while we were preparing for bed, uh, the same camper, Lalo, has a very peculiar position that he likes to sleep in. And uh, my, uh, he's totally fluent in Spanish. He doesn't speak any English at all whatsoever. Me, on the other hand, uh, my Spanish is good, but it's far from perfect. So um, while we're there, uh, me and one of my other friends, Aaron, or we're trying to decipher what Lalo was saying to us for probably what was a good 45 minutes. Now we're lying him down in bed and he's talking to us and he's try we're trying to get him comfortable and we're flipping him from side to side, drawing diagrams, trying to figure out what he's saying and we're having the toughest time. Um, and all the meantime while we're doing this, one of the other campers who's there, uh, this guy Mario, is just laughing hysterically at us because he's watching us and we're <laughs> just going back and forth, trying to understand what he's saying. And what would have been kind of a, a difficult situation quickly became a, a lighthearted situation, because I couldn't help but laugh along with Mario. Because uh, it wasn't so much that he was laughing at us, he was kind of laughing along with us uh, at the same time. And then what really touched me was, at one point, uh, Mario saw that we were struggling trying to get Lalo in the bed. So he actually got up, and Mario's somebody who has cerebral palsy, so he gets up kind of slowly and walks over to us <coughs> and starts to try and assist us with helping position Lalo and get him ready for bed. And 
to me that that just meant everything because that was a huge help. Within five, ten minutes of Mario's help, we had Lalo back comfortably in bed. And uh, in addition, one of the other campers, Polo, um, was taking everything that Lalo was telling us and translating it into a simpler Spanish that was a lot easier for us to understand. And to me, that kind of embodied what fellowship is in Christ. Because although we were there to serve, the other campers that we were serving were there also to help us as well. Despite their disabilities, despite our language differences, they were all there to comfort each other, to help one another. And to me, that's what fellowship is all about. And uh, my second experience I wanted to share was a few days later. Uh, while we were preparing to, for the, the campers to leave, we were saying our final goodbyes, and we all made these goodie bags uh, for the campers to have. And uh, they had, what was it, candy in it? And you know what else? <laughs> Toiletries, candy, and the such. And uh, so we're handing out all of these bags to the campers. And um, there was this one camper, Jesse. She was uh, the brother of the, the guy I was talking about earlier, Mario. Um, as she's walking out, there was this little girl standing right by the side, waving goodbye to everybody. And Jesse stops. Uh, she also has cerebral palsy, and um, she bends down, opens up her bag, and grabs one of the candies out of it that she had in her bag, and then goes and gives the candy to the girl. And nobody else really saw it, except for me, and it, it, it really hit me hard too, because it just showed that kind of no matter what our position is, no matter where we are, we're always in the position to give what we have. And looking at both of these stories now, in comparison, and reflecting on it from what I've been here at home, I started to notice uh, a common thread between all of them. And that's our ability to share. And reflecting on this and on what Lalo said, um, how everybody's the same at this camp, I started to realize that it's our ability to share that makes us kind of united. Whether that's sharing our assistance, like situation and we're sharing in our joys such as in the, the second situation it's our ability to share that unites us and brings about this community